What's up, everybody? This is Illiterate. My name is Evan. My name is Taylor. I read a book this week. I watched a show this week. Lovecraft Country. That's right. We're covering Lovecraft Country on HBO. We did an episode early in the year, back in February, I believe, right, Taylor? Yes. For Color Out of Space, another Lovecraft science fiction film. So we did Lovecraft early in the year. This was right when the uh, release date was announced for this show. And at the time, we said, we might do that in the future. <laughs> Boom, uh, here here we are. We put as much time as we absolutely possibly could in between the episodes. We waited till Lovecraft Country actually concluded. It finally concluded on the 18th of October. Here we are. Might be spoiler-ish. Yeah, we're not going to be covering like, you know, the, to the climax of the whole thing, but like we might reveal some character things or some ideas that came up. So just a fair warning there. If you want to totally, know, you know, be fresh, go watch the show and come back here. If you don't know if you want to watch the show, uh, you want to find out if that's up your alley, maybe you stick around. Maybe you'll figure out if it's for you or not. Yeah. Um, so this is the conjunction of horror fiction of H.P. Lovecraft and racism in the U.S. during the era of Jim Crow. And the question will be, how does that fit together at all? And in just a, a refresher from our previous episode, we talked about his racism. It, you know, his letters have anti-Semitic stuff in praise yeah. of Hitler. He's got racist yeah. poems. He praises lynching and hates mixed race marriages. There's a whole story he has called The Horror at Red Hook, mm. which directly references the evil of the immigrants in the Brooklyn neighborhood in which he lived. Oh, my God. Um, so all of I that is... That Keep that in mind. His his aesthetic has permeated the popular zeitgeist for decades and decades and decades. So how interesting it is that now, you know, obviously we're in a certain place sociopolitically in, in America right now. How interesting it is that we can take one of these uh, renowned authors and really now explore the, the bad mm -hmm. parts of his personality and his writings and use that. What is it about this paranoia, this fear, this fear yeah. of the other, the separated, something different than I and than myself uh, so using that as a, as a direct uh, mm -hmm. horror device, I think is, is, is couldn't be anything more relevant. Um, and of course, you don't know Lovecraft country is just real quickly. It's a, it's about a, a young African American traveling with his uncle and, uh, his, his new love to find his missing father in 1950s, Jim Crow, Southern America. And uh, it's, of course he, uh, goes in, there's dark secrets. It's in Lovecraft country, which is the terminology of the new England setting that is used in his stories. So of course there's going to be ghosts and monsters and, and it's a it's a crazy there. mashup of, of sci-fi horror i mean and this thing goes i mean right out of the gate number 10 is mm -hmm. as high as it can go and it doesn't stay at a 10 <laughs> but it shows you everything that it's capable right out of the gate um <laughs> and it could be yeah. a little bit much for some audiences yeah. this is big time halloween if you're looking for something something spooky something scary but something really diverse and also something that really is trying to discuss something. Um, yeah. This is, and this there, is of course, right now. because it's illiterate. It was based on a novel that came out in 2016 by Matt Ruff called Lovecraft Country. The show developed by Misha Green, this gal who was a writer for the show's Heroes and Sons of Anarchy, and then did the show Underground, which we talked about in our Harriet Tubman episode in July. Right, right. She was a showrunner um, on that. And I just wanted to throw in before we get into how this all got developed for either our international listeners who aren't as aware of American history or just a refresher for everybody, Jim Crow laws, since that's what this focuses on in 1950s America. After the Civil War in the South, there are laws and policies enacted that segregate black and white people, even though the Civil War is over and slavery has ended. There's still separate signs for different yeah. places. And it's, it's sort yeah. of a false narrative because the phrase through the horrible court case was separate but equal. But of course, it wasn't ever actually instituted that way right. in practice. Nothing was ever equal. And then the Jim Crow laws in the North, and this is kind of what the show brings up too, were not explicit, but they still existed all over the country because most of the story takes place in Massachusetts and Chicago. So even though those places, even after yeah, I misspoke as in Southern American, I went, no, <laughs> <laughs> even because even after desegregation, it's like there's still imbalances. And obviously, that's what the U.S. is still grappling with now is yeah. those imbalances. It's just because it's not a law anymore doesn't mean that 
it's not happening. Right. It's um, like, like not like the law was just stricken from the books and it just changed everybody's thoughts and feelings uniformly in that instance. <laughs> right. So, and then in the same tone, in the sci fi and horror space, just in the stories and literature, this is a quote from Misha, the showrunner. She was saying, We're trying to carry the spirit by continuing to reclaim the genre storytelling space that people mm. of color have typically been left out of. So, mm. there's also a, a mm-hmm. dearth of that. So the book, it's funny because it didn't land on any bestsellers list when it came out. The yeah, author, Matt Ruff, he's like, he's like, I had to correct interviewers all the time because it's like, well, it wasn't, you know, bestseller Lovecraft. He's like, no, it didn't. <laughs> Nobody cares. Actually, uh, it wasn't successful. <laughs> well, so it, <laughs> it's only like continuously. Yeah. Actually, yeah. <laughs> It was a really rough time for me, and it <laughs> didn't go um, well. <laughs> so it was uh, not until September of this year did it make it onto the New York Times fiction list. It came back because the show had just <laughs> right. aired on HBO, but before that, it was not. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'd never, I'd never heard of this at all. How mm-hmm. did it? How did it actually start to get some traction? Yeah. So the development. Uh, this is 2007, and Matt Ruff had written a book called Bad Monkeys, which he called kind of his Philip K. Dick novel which we talked Mm. about him before, but it's this murder suspect who claims to belong to this mysterious organization, unreliable narrator, you know, corporations, confusing, is it real, not, that kind of thing. (laughs) It's called Bad Monkeys. And so he was invited by TV producers to pitch some other ideas Mm. for TV shows. So this TV pitch session, they didn't like any of the things he pitched, but they all became books that he wrote after. (laughs) Oh, wow. So one of them. Stuck to him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, well, fine. Um, so show you. This, uh, this book, 88 Names, just came out in March of this year of 2020. It's a cyber thriller. And it's this guy who's paid oh. to guide rich clients in this RPG world. But he suspects that this client might be Kim Jong-un of North Korea. Oh, and there's just all this <laughs> political intrigue within this video game. Bizarre. He pitched that idea. They were like, nah. But he wrote it anyways. <laughs> and then this other one, Mirage, which sort of flips the US and Middle East history, kind of like the plot against America, which we also did. But this is where uh, an extremist Christian group attacks the trade towers in Baghdad in 2001. And it's kind of flipping both oh, cultures. Yeah. And agents of the United Arab States investigate it and they find artifacts from our world. It's sort of, I don't know how it goes. Oh um, but. They they were all just like nah no thanks we're not gonna do that no um, but also <laughs> every I mean, one of these I've been like wow that, what a twist <laughs> yeah and just given the time it's like well that's an all an all Middle Eastern cast you know they're but they didn't want to do it but the book came oh, out in two thousand oh, yeah interesting interesting yeah, yeah yeah and then the other idea was Lovecraft Country which they also didn't take <laughs> <to do that. laughs> so he's like I'm alright but the the influences the three things I could find for his influences on this he was reading a book called Sundown Towns. By James Lowen. And it's so called that because it's the, like we talked about this unspoken segregation. There's a real book called The Negro Motorist Green Book, which was published in 1937. Mm-hmm. It was this guy who was a postal worker. And it shows you in these towns what they call sundown towns, where it's like it's not written anywhere, but it's not safe to be there if you're wow. black after dark yeah. because bad things are going to happen and you're not welcome. And so he knew which areas, which towns, which hotels, which restaurants would serve you, all of that stuff. And it There's got an distributed sequence early in in the series that that uh, depicts exactly that mm-hmm. um, a sundown town as the sun is setting. It's a pretty exhilarating sequence. Yeah, so that's where he he heard about that idea was from this book, and it features in Lovecraft Country as the safe Negro travel guide. And it's interesting because this was before, but there was a film that won the Oscar, very contentious, called Green Book, and that yes. features prominently in there. But people didn't really know about it until this book Sundown Towns came out and the interest in it and the revival of what was this green book? That's crazy that there was this whole underground map of places that were safe in the 1950s. So that was number one. He was also inspired. There was an essay by this gal, Pam Knowles, in 2006 called Shame. I'll post a link to it, but it was about her experience growing up black and geeky and the way her family made her interrogate how the portrayal of race was done in media Mm-hmm. just like how there's no black characters in sci-fi or she was so excited by star right. wars and it's like but we can't relate even the people that are that live in the desert why aren't why isn't their skin even slightly darker like it right. doesn't doesn't make sense so it's just her sort of lamenting that and like hoping and every time she would go to the library as a kid like where is there a book for me yeah that that should like why are yeah. they all why are all of the swords and sorcery and princesses and kings why are they all white 
to yeah i mean for anybody out there i mean i think our, our audience probably is <laughs> pretty hip but right. uh, you know like that's the reason if you wonder like why so many people are talking about this and why like disney is falling over itself to put these characters in in star wars etc 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 all their reboots that's the reason is because there is somebody experiencing a total shutout from these mm-hmm. things They're, these little these little girls these little boys go around looking for something to identify with they really do and f- for too long they're left identifying with archetypes that look something different than themselves yeah and how odd is that so that's so we've what got to be yeah. opening ourselves up to to hearing uh those those types of arguments mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so he's like what's the thematic bridge between the two well it's lovecraft so it's right. not even necessarily the tone of the Lovecraft works. His original TV pitch was, it's the X-Files if Mulder and Scully were a black travel writing family living in the Jim Crow era. So it follows this family who owns a travel agency in the 50s, and the main character, Atticus, is a field researcher who looks for hotels and restaurants, and then there's paranormal events along the way. And so the goal wasn't even necessarily to like make it oh, like man, Lovecraft I'm like more stories. in that. <laughs> I've seen the yeah. whole series. And I'm um, like, you told me the, the synopsis of that. And I'm like, oh man, that sounds real cool. Because the, the central yeah. heartbeat of this thing is, again, I said it was more about the missing father and family lineage and fulfilling some sort of like yeah. ordained purpose. That, it, like, it really relates more even down just to the title, Lovecraft Country, that gives you a reason to be going there and experiencing mm-hmm. these different places. What are you going to happen across in these different towns? We're going to come, yeah. come across some downtowns. You're going to come across you're reporting on it yeah and that and oh, man and they passed on everything <laughs> and like, so well he was like one of he was like has had like yeah. a glimmer of like ooh, you know and I, <laughs> right. at least personally as an artist i'm like oh there's like like the cool concept and some sort of silver lining of ah mm-hmm. on it and they just went nah <laughs> we're good yeah so he's like fine i'll do it as a book too so that's how that came out which is funny because as i read it so the book consists of eight interconnected stories they're almost like mini novellas and as i read it i was like this looks like it was made for tv and it's like oh because yeah, it was like it, it, it was <laughs> yeah so yeah each character gets their own novella essentially and it's like it's it's exploring a variety of these pulp sci-fi horror fiction tropes of interesting horror sci-fi fantasy and and Um, interestingly enough that you said that because i thought it was going to do that i mean and as we've covered to to adapt these things from book to television takes a ton of comporting and different mediums entirely everything gets uh, swished around so but i'm really intrigued of how they go from eight chapters about characters to 10 episodes yeah. that never stop cutting. So they definitely mix them all together. But in the book, it's like part one is episodes one and two of the show. That's the pilot. And the second episode is the creepy mansion occult. Part mm. two of the book is the haunted house story with Letitia. But mm-hmm. it's basically like a ghost story kind of thing. Part three is the stealing of the book from the museum. It's more like an action thing. Part four is Hippolyta finding the other dimension, kind of like the sci-fi thing. Part five is Ruby transforming the body horror. So they definitely block them all out. Where they sort of go differently with the show is with the Korean woman. None of that is in the book. That's a totally new element? That's a totally new element, yeah. How bizarre, because she ends up being like the linchpin towards the (laughs) Right. And once- Yeah. Wild. Yeah. So once (laughs) that is that part, and that's the flashback stuff, it kind of changes towards the second half of the show, and they end up mixing it much more. But uh, but all this stuff, it's crazy, because it's like, well, that's literally every episode of the show. They had it made Yeah, I mean, it sounds like they're hitting all all the beats there. Just It definitely wound up in a very different form. That's fascinating. That's Mm -hmm. super fascinating. Yeah. And we won't go into all the differences of the book versus the show, obviously, but in the show, there's a time travel bit and there's a weird meta part where the actual book Lovecraft country comes in because they go to an alternate dimension or something in the future, <laughs> I think, in the show. And that you've seen it, but they they point out that it's written by the main character's future son. And he's literally- This is point- bizarre. This, <laughs> yeah. this starts to, to step into some other, I mean, meta. I mean, it's completely meta territory. So yeah, right. please. Uh, but they point this out, this, they literally this point out some of the main <laughs> differences of the book, the real book Lovecraft Country, which is in the show, the fake book that the son wrote. So it's like the main evil woman, Christina, is a yeah. man, Caleb, in the book. And he mentions that okay. as if his son had written that in this alternate future. But it's yes. just crazy, weird- <laughs> Weird stuff. But uh, obviously, Atticus's future son did not write it in real life right. as Atticus it is in the is show. Not like the, the, so, like the, and this is not based on somebody's father who did something incredible right. in the Korean War, who came back and told these stories, and then he made it right. because he loved Lovecraft, and then he mashed it up with his favorite. No, no. 
So the, <laughs> so the real guy who wrote it, Matt Ruff, and when I first looked into it, this is perhaps the least reported, but maybe equally as interesting facet of this is he's a white man from New York and he came up with this whole story. I think there's something to be said here for, you know, the 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 initial the spark for whatever gets ignited. Um mm-hmm. that idea, whoever has the spark, it's got to be the right spark to catch fire. Whoever has it, that's valid. Uh yeah. hey, this ended up propping up an incredible amount of minority artists and getting an important historically st- sourced and uh, thematically rich and uh, neglected material out there into the mainstream. I mean, this is produced by J.J. Abrams and and Bad Robot. This is as big as it can be. That ended up doing so much good. So, you know, when we we think about this idea of their originality, oh, because it's almost is like an assumption. Of course, this came, you know, this obviously came from the idea of a black man. Well, actually, actually not. And it's interesting even going back and looking at his uh, his 2001 uh, Muz, uh, well, all his uh, other stuff yeah, yeah all yeah, his so. other stuff you can see this he's flipping yeah. these things on their heads so there's there's a ticking wheel there there's some real thought going there and i think mm-hmm. as, as long as thought is really happening man that's valid let's go yeah because so i wanted look to what t- it, yeah. look what it did it, it served some real good here yeah so i just thought like fro- straight from the horse's mouth what does he say about it and so the, the quote from the beginning i saw he's like if i do this right it'll be a great story and if i do this wrong i will be horribly embarrassed <laughs> which is a sign that you're on the right track. And he was like, yeah, if I, I wouldn't say I was comfortable doing this, but I was confident I could do justice to the characters or figure it out before I embarrassed myself publicly or just not show it because by that point I realize it's, it's not working kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like it scared him. It sounds like, it sounds like he was confident, but like knew the risk. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's really, yeah. that's really so for some, some of his background also, cause people, so he grew up in a multicultural household. His father was a minister. He grew up in Brooklyn. His mom is from Southern Brazil. And so he said his house was oh, basically yeah. an Ellis Island for immigrating relatives and people oh, have different cool. religions and different ways yeah. of living. And so he's like, everyone loved to argue. And I just saw <laughs> straight out the gate, we can have different things, but everybody's from a different place and was just yeah. a lot of writers or listeners oh, awesome. and so he did what a, lot a point of, of view yeah he like growing up in that hey arnold house right <laughs> yeah <laughs> like you said he, he says his novels are all over the place but they always involve some sort of a culture clash or all his protagonists come from a different background than him and a different yeah, some world flipping view. duality yeah yeah that, that mm-hmm. yeah I, I, just you rattling off some of the log lines of what he's done i go oh wow he's playing with something there that's cool. yeah it's really it's a really neat idea that's yeah. why i was so frustrated like eh, no they said no to all god i'm mad yeah <laughs> <laughs> so he said the real challenge was not the characters from his perspective but the history and doing yeah. making that work because he was oh, like that the idea of a whites only ambulance that would literally let black people bleed to death rather than lift a finger to help him he's like that sounds like dystopian science fiction but that was exactly that's that's America. exactly my 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 point here is like well what what i mean the, racism i mean you're inherently setting up um a, di- a dueling reality mm-hmm. there are the people walking through reality but it's separate from from somebody else's. I mean, that's really what it's setting up here. So why not actually take that as a as a direct metaphor? Let's take it to the ends of the earth. Let's get monsters in here. Let's get vampire creatures howling at the moon. You know, like the aliens. Let's go. Let's go to. Let's fi- let's figure yeah. out. Let's figure out what's running the universe and how we're the controller of all of our beings and we can go to any time. And so, I mean, they they tackle they tackle all of this. I mean, yeah. He was like, uh, once I figured out the the background to it all, it's like. It's just how do intelligent, resourceful human beings respond? That's the yeah. that's the straightforward yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I can write that. But he was like, also ask me again, you know, in hindsight, in, in 10 years, if I would have done something different, probably. But he's like, I feel like I've done it enough justice. And part of that comes from, like we said, the history, the reading, the research. So like, I'll post a link to the the reading list from his website. He puts down all the useful resources and everything that he read and everything that he did, including mm. that book, Sundown That's Towns, awesome. if you're interested in everything that he did. He was also like, I read a whole the whole year's worth of the Chicago Defender, which was a black newspaper in Chicago from the year 1954, yeah. to get a sense of the cultural issues that black Chicagoans would be talking about. So he was like, oh, wow, I was yeah. like, I was living there for a whole yeah. year, <laughs> getting everything that everybody's saying and all the editorials and the news and the, yeah. and, and all that stuff. He's like, everything was there. 
So just some of the historical items of note from the book or the show, just three or four things since there, it is heavily inundated. And I know Misha Green added tons of stuff. Oh, that it's, even happens. it's heavily referential. I mean, most, uh, mm-hmm. especially for the first few episodes, uh, so many of your key images are, are referential of major art. Yeah. It's just all over the place. It is pulling. It is pulling, yeah. pulling, pulling. This thing is super referential. <laughs> and even from ahead of time, because there's a lot of James Baldwin stuff, which is like he was an author after the 1950s, right. but she yeah. still puts it in there. But some of the stuff, the Chicago housing situation, which gets mentioned in the haunted ghost kind of vignette. So in right, 1951, right. Very, very prevalent. Yeah. The big one that they're referencing is Harvey and Janetta Clark moving into an apartment. This mob gathered as people stoned their new home. And because it was an apartment, the whole thing got firebombed. And then we also talked about riots from the Red Summer. So there were several from that time period that happened in Chicago. And then even afterwards in 66, when MLK came to visit and was hit with a rock by somebody. So that's Chicago and housing and all of that. And then there was a part of that as well involved in with experimentation. Um, Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> which seemed even more science fictiony, but there was this guy, the the big one that they're referencing is this guy Sims, who was known as the father of gynecology, but he came to his oh, discoveries is- from experimenting on slaves. Oh, uh, gosh. Just horrible. I mean, how, I mean, yeah, I've never even thought about that. Number one, if you take like, uh, you know, iconography from like MK Ultra, you, like, and, and so, and many things have been made based on that. How many yeah. of them involve african-american main characters yeah supporting characters and almost none clearly it's almost weird that these things yeah. haven't been explored until now i mean it did it really take get out being that successful for hollywood to go ah black horror is profitable <laughs> like it's almost sad you know it's like we should we should you know like what was the the, the i guess the, the closest thing i can think of is candy yeah. man it was really popular as a franchise in the 90s guess what also jordan peele's in the middle of that reboot that movie will be out next year <laughs> Yeah, switching over to the civil rights side of things as opposed to the sort of sci-fi element. Gordon Parks is a famous photographer of the 1950s, yes. and he sort of showed neon American prosperity with the separation of race. So I'll post a link to a lot of his photos. That These show are the ones that they the tried to recreate with the imagery of the film or the show, I believe, in terms of this showing the difference of like whites only, coloreds only, that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. And actually Kendrick Lamar has a music video for the oh. song Element and it's all references to Gordon Parks's photography. Oh wow. I had no idea. That's fanc- that's fascinating. And then from the book we already mentioned the Green Book and then the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre, which this book preceded the Watchmen thing which we covered in June, but that was also brought up. Uh, we were talking before the show this, you know, <sighs> when the it's incredible to watch um because it these i mean yes these two shows were housed at HBO but at some point they definitely could not have been uh, so well you know familiar with each other that they were aware like oh you're doing 1921 you're just like right. that it's well and also they this were book they were happening upon on it that book came out there's another article is what i think led david lindelof for for watchmen mm-hmm. so it was the, the we're encroaching on these ideas they're coming and it's just people who have their fingers on the pulse, who are paying attention and have the wheels spinning in their head, who pick up on the, on this thing. And you hope as an artist that you're picking up on the right things, that you're talking about things that really matter to you. Uh, and because if they matter to you and you have a spark to talk about them, then that means more than likely somebody else out there is going to have that yeah. that spark too. And if you can convey that to them, you're really cooking. So then the, the people that he conveys this spark to, 2016 rolls around, the book comes out does not become a bestseller. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he gets a call and they say, oh, it's Jordan Peele. He wants to talk to you about Lovecraft Country and Misha Green as well. And Matt Ruff has seen Underground, so he knows her. And he's like, okay, yeah, sounds good. You know, We'll be in touch. And then mm-hmm. the first trailer for Get Out comes out. And he's like, oh, oh now it makes go. sense. Because nobody there knew that Jordan Peele was was right. interested in doing this sort of work. Nobody knew he was capable, hard, right. you know, like to be honest. I mean, he was doing totally different types of work. That's why he yeah. made such the hard shift is the industry was pigeonholing him and he said absolutely not. Yeah. So um, then he gets it cuz there's Jordan Peele and Misha together. So then he said he's talking to Misha, he's like, "Here's my research, here's all my notes." 
And as we've seen time and again with people doing the right thing when their thing gets adapted, he's like, I don't expect you to do a carbon copy. That would be boring. Like, do your own cool <laughs> thing with it. And she does do her own cool thing with it. He also Man, that, yeah. that, that speaks volumes of just having, you know, like understanding the difference between the medium and understanding your strengths. Uh, that's I mean, yeah. knowing yours and knowing somebody else's and understanding where that value uh, gives and takes. That's incredible. Yeah. He also mentions some other works tied into Lovecraft or racism or things like that. And I thought that would be worth mentioning. One of which, oh, yeah. very serendipitous, it's called The Ballad of Black Tom. The author is Victor Laval, and he's an African-American author who also is from New York. And there's an interview with both of them because his book came out the exact same day as Lovecraft Country. Oh, and no it is way. it is the counter story to the racist Lovecraft horror at Red Hook that we mentioned at the beginning. So what? it is a story. What are the odds that they come out on the same day? That's in, <laughs> that's absolutely crazy. If we're talking, yeah. oh man, if if you thought I was crazy talking about how you know people are have their thumb on the pulse and ideas are are on their way at some like look, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's from the POV of this black character who you know wouldn't even have a name in the original story <laughs> that he put, and it's everything that Lovecraft is disparaging. But that's the main character of this wow. of this story. God. <laughs> And just kind of rounding out the whole thing, getting back to Lovecraft, because this is not a in praise of him by any means. His work is influential, but the Lovecraft country was never meant, like I said, even at the oh idea yeah, no, of this, it, yeah, it was. This designed, is not saying we love Lovecraft. This is taking some of his worst worst elements and using them as a way to discuss mm -hmm. uh, some of the worst elements in 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 society today. And that's what uh, I thought was how interesting. How we got there was the fact that like racism being at the heart of his work, because what is it when we talk about him? It's the fear of the other, the alien. And then yes. like in Color Out of Space, everybody goes insane because they don't understand it. It's like that the education and knowledge of that would make you mad and insane yeah. is also so crazy because that's his. It's like, don't learn about other people because they could be lizard people. You know, it's like <laughs> that's. And so I just thought it's such an interesting corollary, and it's really what the show is and the book is getting at the heart at. A, the, the different way of thinking about it being like, if racism isn't about arrogance or judgment over somebody else, but it's about the fear and the terror, which yeah. that's the powerful way to fight it is to question yeah. and dispel that fear. So if you instead of responding to someone who that you're saying, oh, you're arrogant or judgmental because you're racist and not being like you're a moron, but being like, what are you so scared of? Yeah, what that's, are you afraid of? That's what makes it powerful. That's yes. the way that's a different way to approach it. It's just hilarious. And maybe not even hilarious. That's how you get your high school coach's attention. You say, <laughs> what are you afraid of? And he goes, what? Right. It's just so fast. <laughs> it's so fascinating that Lovecraft is like at the heart of this issue, even though he doesn't want to be <laughs> at all. Like he's he's <laughs> opening the door for the conversation. Well, I mean, I think it's I think it's kind of uh, incredible that just being and putting on record what he did, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it gives these artists license to come in and go, oh, how interesting you had these weird, these feelings at that time. Now we're going to actually talk about them and comport <laughs> right. them and try to make sense of them uh, and, and show how bizarre and small that way of thinking would be. Yeah. Uh, good one. Good one there, Lovecraft. <laughs> uh, we'll show you. We'll, we'll show you what we can do with your second draft here. Uh, yeah. So this continuing to reclaim this type of storytelling of sci-fi horror, cosmic horror, all of that stuff that we haven't seen. Well, I think that does it for today. Thank you so much, Taylor. Thank you. This was a blast. Thank you guys for listening. Thanks for being with us. Let us know what you're reading, what you're watching, what you're waiting for. Uh, you never know. We might do it as an episode. So please get in touch with us at IlliteratePod on Instagram, and we will catch you next week. Yeah.